So the reason we're here, and we've got Michelle Porter able to join us, and it's my privilege to introduce Michelle. She's joining us from St. John's, Newfoundland, and Michelle is a research, a poet, a journalist, among many, many other things. She currently holds an Aboriginal postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Guelph, and before she started her postdoc, Michelle completed a master's degree in folklore and a PhD in geography at Memorial University. Michelle is an incredibly accomplished um, scholar, writer, uh, poet. Um, she has received the 2005 Atlantic Journalism Award, the 2016 Newfoundland and Labrador Arts and Letters Award for Poetry, and I think she's been nominated every year for the CBC Poetry Prize that I can rethink of uh, on that side of things. Her most recent publication is called Approaching Fire, and it's available from Breakwood, uh, sorry, Breakwater Books. And I'll stick in the chat box um, a hyperlink where you can find that information on that publication. And the Approaching Fire is, I'll just give you a quick background, it fashions a textual documentary of rescue and insight and a glowing contemplation of the ways in which loss can be generated and unbridled renewal. And a colleague of hers described the book as braiding strands of history, genealogy, oral tradition, family culture, and poetry. And that Michelle has created this lyrical, structurally innovative, original memoir out of it. And it's a, she described it as a rare kind of book that speaks to all of us about lost stories of the yearning to recover and uncover the past that informs our understanding of the present. So with that, uh, I'm ex really excited to have Michelle join the speaker series, and I'll turn the proverbial floor over to yourself for your discussion. Thank you so much for that uh, glowing introduction, Ryan. That was lovely. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm today. I get, I'll, I'll just get right into it because I have, I have quite a good script. But I wanted to thank University of Guelph and and um, uh, the whole department for uh, for uh, supporting this postdoc and and letting me just do do my thing. So today I'll tell you about the research and writing process behind the two books I've just completed. Uh, one's been published. It's the, it's the one Ryan talked about with the Newfoundland Publishing House. It's called Approaching Fire. The other has been accepted and it's being peer reviewed as we speak with Wilfred, uh, Wilfred Laurier University Press. So neither are traditional academic texts. Both are creative nonfiction with uh, uh, blending in different genres. They're different in tone, intent and audience. The question I want to explore by talking about these two books right now today um, and talking about the research and writing process is what does the arts-based research process bring to research questions and why do we do it? I've used the term crooked methodologies in the title to refer to a Métis approach to playing tunes, but I'll get to that in a moment. So first, you know, in the, in, in the uh, proper way, I'm going to introduce myself a bit more. I'm a member of the Manitoba Métis Federation and a uh, citizen of the Métis Nation of Canada. Uh, I'm living in Newfoundland, Labrador right now, but I'm not from here. I'm a descendant of the Goulet family line from the Red River Settlement established in the 1700s in Manitoba. Uh, my great grandfather, a fiddle performer uh, who made some of the first Métis music recordings, uh, Robert Léon Goulet, he gave up the promise of the script plant and moved with his family away from Manitoba to BC. Um, after he did that, my grandmothers and my mother's generations became a part of the Métis diaspora, many of whom moved again and again and again in search of a place to build home. So the meanings of this mobility as resilience and mobility as survival among a segment of Canada's Métis people, it's been the subject of most of my research and writing, but it's appeared in very different ways. The ways in which Métis imagine our future and how this future can be created is that the center of indigenous settler, settler reconciliation efforts today. My, my um, or Métis settler reconciliation efforts today. My goal with this project has been to contribute to these efforts um, through the development of new compelling narratives about multi-generational Métis cultural continuation and survival strategies. So, um, is big goals. Uh, two of the main questions that have motivated my work is how do Métis lived experiences of home and moving um, with uh, and relationship with the land inform stories uh, related to our past, our present, and our future? Uh, 
And also how are Métis writers reimagining their futures in the face of shifting connections to homeland and identity? And I've, I've been focusing quite a bit with some of the, uh, some of the uh, fictional uh, writers that you see here. There's Kevin Vermette, Cherie Dimeline uh, right there. Um, I've been using arts-based research and writing as a research process. Uh, as the center parts of my methodology uh, in recent years. Um, this is the part that is in academia crooked. I'm not using crooked in the Newfoundland way to mean cross or grumpy, um, but in the Métis way to refer to the crooked tunes. Um, these are the songs that use typical song structures, but they vary the meter, the beats per measure, they improvise sections differently in each song. A lot of times traditional Métis fiddlers back then and now added an extra beat here and there, wherever they felt it necessary. So um, I think of arts-based methodologies in this way, that those who use visual arts, writing, music, or other creative arts to interpret academic research are taking standard scientific knowledge and playing it like a traditional Métis fiddler, like my great-grandfather and my uh, grandmother. And I'm proud to do this. I don't play music, but in the course of my research, I've realized that I continue the family tradition of playing crooked, but I do it with research and writing. <laughs> um, just a quick note, this is um, an advertisement for the Red River Echoes, which was um, uh, quite famous in its, the 1930s in Manitoba. And those are my family members. My grandmother is in there. Um, this, this book, Approaching Fire, you'll see, you see the title there, it focused on Métis music traditions and the tradition of crooked, crooked music, it draws on family history stories and historical research and oral history interview research with immediate and extended family members to put together one version, there could be many versions of the history of the Red River Echoes. Tied into all of this is the goal to develop a strong and artistic writing pra practice. The focus on the family unit that made up the Red River Echoes in this book is important. Uh, Leanne Simpson suggested that our ancestors often acted within the family unit to physically survive, to pass on what they could to their children and to occupy and use our lands as we, as, as we always had. With Approaching Fire, the goal was to let people hear through text, <laughs> the musical tradition and the story of Robert Leon Coulet's music. Through arts-based research, a whole new audience will hear these traditions um, and be exposed to them through this book. An audience that would not have had access to uh, these stories and not know about this music. And, and even uh, Bob Boulay, when he moved, a big part of my question was why did they move from this place where, where the music was um, doing so well and they were so well known. Um, his contemporaries became Métis music legends, and he moved away. And uh, people were looking for him. He was missing. Was he real? Uh, so this fascinated me. Um, you know, all the stories I heard, I, I could hear growing up. I ate them all up. So this is part of ensuring that we'll continue to make crooked music, music that start, starts true to its roots, even while changing and uh, flourishing. Scratching River is the book that's with uh, Wilfred Laurier right now, being peer reviewed. Um, it isn't a single story, it's a collection of stories and voices braided on the page in order to create order from the sometimes chaotic rhythm of actual lived experience and uh, memory. In this book, I explore the ways Métis have created home and continue to create home through a storied mobile social geography that is always on the move. I suggest that it is in what have been named weaknesses, mobility, for example, that the strength and future of the Métis are located. Broadly, this book explores the geographical entanglements between home, land, and mobility among the Métis diaspora. Uh, and I use quite a range of documents, including um, news sources, uh, such as this one. Because Scratching River foregrounds the story of a search for home for my older brother, who holds the dual diagnoses of schizophrenia and autism. Broader context and specific details are told through news stories and the transcript of a documentary about the abuse my brother suffered in one of the homes he lived in. 
Uh, these journalistic voices are grounded in a more intimate orality through one-sided conversations between myself and my sister and the life story of a Métis ancestor and the traveling he did as a child for hunting and trading with his parents. So I'm keeping that connection between contemporary Métis experiences and historical um, and trying as much as he can to look ahead. Um, as the pieces come together, the book offers the braided river as a metaphor. For both of these books, writing has been a way to think through Métis embodied connections to geographies of home, land, and mobility in particular. The recent controversy over the Métis Nation of Canada's map of Métis homelands is a clear indication that contesting claims to home remain important to topics for writers to approach creatively, creatively particularly Métis, Indigenous, all these topics, uh, home becomes really important. We are in need of stories to help people grapple with the multiple entanglements of home. How do you tell what can't be told and how do you write what can't be written? Writing is a research process is one answer. These paired questions are behind these book length arts-based research creations. As is the case with life writing in general, these books are at once personal and political. I wrote these books in order to better understand my own place in the Métis nation and my own historical uh, relationship to mobility and home. That my brother's story appeared as a result of this research process was completely unexpected. And yet there he is at the center of that second book I've, I've written that's part of this presentation. Um, and, that, and he is the center of the one written for an academic audience. Um, what does arts-based research bring? So yeah, um, I, I anticipating this, this audience would likely have um, a number of students. I thought I'd do this little summary. So arts-based research, it's a process. It's not necessarily an end product. It depends how you want to engage with it. You don't have to be an artist for this to benefit your research. Though if you are, your process is probably going to be different than somebody who um, uh, uh, doesn't have that practice. Uh, engaging with the academic knowledge through the arts can build connections uh, between um, disciplines, between data and stories, the way we feel, the way we make meaning, and help us understand how it is we, we know or think we know what we know. Um, I think one of the most important things at this point for me is it can be used as a decolonial research process because it can foreground stories and relationships with the land in, uh, in multiple ways. Um, uh, it can begin to get at the intangible that scientific data can sometimes struggle with, such as the effect, effective connections that really are so much part of our motivation and the meaning of a geography or of a phenomenon. And there's always, always unexpected finds when you let an arts practice into your research. You'll never forget these, those, and you'll want to share them in your, in your presentations. And you know what? People always remember um, those, those little bits that you've shared. Um, in writing these books, I wanted to build on years of research into the meaning of contemporary home, as I've, I've, I've said. So it's a complicated notion, and it's been approached academically from many, many points of view. I found that the application of ideas exploring critical geographies of home, the most productive to my research and my arts-based research, um, because this led to a decolonial understanding of home as mobile and place-based concept. I've wanted to focus on, as Barnhill noted in this book, um, at home on the earth, um, on the possibilities of being at home on the earth, finding place, re-inhabitation, and recognizing that our relationship to the earth is radical. And I built on Blunt and Dowling's approach to the study of critical geographies of home. In this framework, it's not only a material space, but an imaginative and emotive space that is created through connections across multiple scales, um, the local, national, transnational. And the most important to me is um, it, uh, home is an important site that is uh, but often overlooked site for decolonial work. Um, for good reason, um, uh, recent scholars have argued that home is a normative concept based in European values. These ideas of home shaped the way Canada was formed and continue to shape uh, the way we understand cultural claims to land and to homelands. Although written about the Australian context, it is also true of Canada. 
that since colonization, the nation state has attempted through an array of social, legal, economic, and cultural practices to break indigenous people's ontological connections to land and to cast them as homeless in the modern world. Um, and it's uh, very much recognized geopolitics is influenced by and emerges from home. Um, literary work, so not only scholarly work, but literary work explore uh, connections between notions of mobility, home, and, and the future. Just two quick examples here. This, this beautiful book of poetry by Marilyn Dumont is one. She uses the Red River cart as a symbol of home and mobility. Um, in her book of poems, The Pemmican Eaters, uh, Katharina Vermette does so much with notions of home in all of her work, but in particular North End love songs. She uses the images of bird to invoke birds to invoke potential mobility in her homes. So mobility becomes a way of understanding a contemporary Métis woman, which appear in the songs as well. Um, and there's been an interesting shift among Indigenous and Métis writers towards science fiction. And the geographies of home and homeland that emerge in these books are so interesting. They emerge after political, economic, climate change disasters of all sorts, uh, but they always emerge. <laughs> Um, in the introduction to the anthology, Indigenous Poetics, Neil McLeod wrote that it's important that Indigenous writers move beyond writing dislocation and find their way to home. So there's long been this focus on really pointing out the dislocation, that intergenerational dislocation um, of um, many, Métis in particular, Indigenous broadly, uh, but point your stories in the direction of finding your way home. Um, my recent books relied on writing as a vehicle to explore, as Adis wrote, the many ways Métis have had to continue to have and struggle to hold on to understandings and relationships to the water, land, air, sky, and animals. And that many Métis have been able to adapt themselves to and weave themselves uh, with new models of, uh, of being Métis. So how do we do this? What are some of the tools? And I, I, I thought um, how to bring just a couple of quick ones from each book. The reason I'm bringing each, both, both books to this is because I used different, uh, different um, I borrowed from different disciplines in placing the literary, the oral history, um, the news, but just placing them all together. Uh, so in approaching fire, I built the Métis research and family stories around uh, a fire ecologist, Kira, Dr. Kira Hoffman's research into traditional fire burning out in BC. Um, this was during a time I started um, some of this interest during a time when there was all the fires burning in BC. Um, and, um, and, and in the years since there's been fires, huge fires, as you know, burning everywhere. And um, you know, a renewed call for an, a better understanding of the traditional fire burning and what it means. So I put that beside family stories and built that into intergenerational uh, fire burning, the burning of stories, the healing, the renewal, that both things play into each other. So this approach I consider a decolonial intervention in that indigenous people have always turned to the land and the natural world to understand themselves um, among, you know, other things. Arch, arts, Arts approaches, arts-based approaches, allows that to happen from the ground up rather than from the science down. Um, and I think we need, we need both. Now in Scratching River, um, I really got excited about uh, research papers and a variety of research on river morphology, morphology uh, with a focus on braiding rivers. So uh, that's where some of the braiding metaphors come about. Um, so these allows for this, this, this practice allows for understanding, teaching, and learning across multiple layers, the physical, the scientific, the emotional. And it's both in teaching and learning, um, having multiple, having an understanding reach into multiple layers. It, it stays with you, you think about it, and it grows with you as you, as you grow as a person. I'm just going to quickly check where I'm at with time so I know if I can, okay. Refusal uh, is an important part of the threads that follow my older brother's story of mental illness and abuse in Scratching River. And this is just a quick picture here of um, uh, a braided rib river in uh, actually Northern Canada. So Scratching River's fragmented and braided structure. So I really built um, 
that book around a braided river structure. I structured it as a braided river. Um, it's a refusal to fill in the gaps left by violence, the refusal to create a satisfying closure for the reader, uh, as a river does or doesn't, and the refusal to reinstate um, uh, the violence that uh, came to my, my brother's life. Uh, and you know, into my into my home as a result. Instead, this book it's a critical rereading of one family's place in geography, time, and circumstance, and evolves into an embodied reading of the land and intergenerational knowledge and connections. Um, I, I'm also looking at how Métis lived experiences of home and mobility across time have informed all our stories and the way we understand ourselves. Um, and the next step to that, every, you know, every, um, uh, you know, Métis writer and um, uh, Indigenous writing mentors, they talk about how do you point your story, you know, how, how are you going to, how are you going to move the flow of your story? Um, and so through that, you know, you take your, you, you invite your story, and I did that as a Métis writer, and to reimagine you know, possible Métis futures um, in the face of shifting connections to homeland and identity. Um, I've long since uh, believed with, you know, the multiple uh, writers and theorists who talk about how we make ourselves and our world through our stories. Um, and this, the reason stories are central to our ability to build reconciliation processes that are meaningful to Indigenous and settler ways of being. So these books are really only a first step for me personally, because um, you know there's so much more to do, uh, but they've been a challenging step um, toward decolonizing, um, you know, my own understanding of land, home, and home relationships in Canada, and inviting others into the process because you write a book for other people, um, and it will continue to be a core part of my personal and academic reconciliation processes. Um, I'm just going to, how much time do I have here? 155, okay. I'm going to skip this one and I'll go to, um, there are some books I relied on as, as creative prompts. This is um, Red River Trails, Ox Cart Routes Between St. Paul and the Selkirk Settlement. And this quote I liked because it, it, it dealt with the history of Métis travel across, but especially the trails. And there's a real, a real focus of the way these trails changed over time as, you know, ox carts, Red River carts, uh, you know, created in, in many ways helped to shape the North America as, as we know it for, you know, uh, in a variety of ways. Um, this is from Vanishing Spaces, memoirs of Louis Goulet. So um, Louis Goulet's memoir, he's, he's, he's a, a relative from Oh, uh, an uncle of my great grandfather. <laughs> so, you know, you could trace it way back, but um, uh, his memoirs were taken down. And I was really taken with um, uh, one chapter of his memoirs that, that describes um, a fire as they're out um, buffalo hunting out on the prairie and how they respond to it, um, how they, uh, you know, how they uh, try and uh, prevent getting caught up in it, the signs they're looking for on the land. Um, <clears throat> again, this is, you know, um, how they know uh, two years of drought made it, made, um, you know, the prairies tin, uh, a veritable carpet of tinder and what they're trying to do. And here's the, you know, the fire actually coming up over them. So this is, these are quotes that, that make it through my book and I write in response to them in approaching fire, of course, um, as if blown by a hurricane, the fire came so quickly that herds of antelope and deer are trying to escape or caught and roasted on their feet. It's beyond the powers of imagination to conceive of the terror that can grip one's soul at the sight of roaring walls of flame nearly a uh, hundred feet high. So he's actually, as a, I mean, um, Louis Goulet, those memoirs, you know, there's, there's papers written about them, you know, critiquing, uh, you know, uh, right, what's his point of view? What was the point of view of the people collecting it? What's the point of view of the translation? Because of course it was in French, um, Edouard Mitchif um, at first, and it was all translated. So, uh, but the version that has reached me is so uh, amazingly evocative. He's an amazing storyteller. 
Um, I just want to talk a little bit about creative nonfiction, the genre that I have primarily decided to work in. And um, it's, you know, it's a bit of its relationship to poetry, because I also, I mean, I work primarily in poetry and creative nonfiction. Um, creative nonfiction is a bit like poetry. It's a rich playground. Um, and I've, I've loved it. As, as I've loved poetry because there are formal restrictions. I think that that's appealed to me. It's a little bit of the academic of me working, working within restrictions. The most pervasive and unavoidable of these restrictions involves the truth and the writer's relationship to it. But as with poetry, you can tell the truth and tell it slant or crooked or upside down or with authority or as though it's fiction and there is the fun. Um, I can have lots of things to say about uh, the practice of placing creative nonfiction and engaging in that alongside uh, academic research, which is um, I'm going to be doing a little bit more of going forward. Um, and, uh, you know, the skill uh, it can take to pull that off. But I'm going to go right to the uh, end of my presentation now because I only have one more minute. No, is that true? Is that not true, Ryan? Am I wrong? You've got lots of time. I've got lots of time? Okay, all right. All right, because I actually, I did um, add a little bit more to this section because I thought that it might even be a little bit of the part that many of the students here, um, uh, many of the, you know, may not have be grounded in uh, coming from different disciplines. Um, it's one thing to explore theories that focus on the critical geographies of home and academic writing, uh, but it's another to apply it in creative nonfiction to one's own life stories, structure, uh, memories actually, and ancestors. The writer is faced with questions about form, genre, structure, and, and, and process. The approach I took to writing about memory, future, and reconciliation is reflected in this description of nonfiction in the introduction to Best Kind, um, a collection of short nonfiction pieces by Newfoundland writers. The book's editor, Dr. Robert Finley, uh, quotes Theodore Adorno, who offers what is perhaps what Robert Finley considers perhaps the finest description of the form's basic structure. In the essay, he says, thought does not advance in a single direction. Rather, the aspects of the argument interweave as in a carpet. The fruitfulness of the thoughts depends on the density of this texture. Actually, the thinker does not think, but rather transforms himself into an arena of intellectual experience. Without simplifying it, the essay proceeds, so to speak, methodically, unmethodically. And, and I thought that if, if two words put together describe a little bit of uh, moving ahead with an art space process, methodically, unmethodically, um, are, is, is a beautiful, <laughs> are beautiful two words. Um, Approaching Fire is written in documentary poetry. Other forms of poetry and nonfiction and um, borrows from the essay form. Scratching River is situated between the personal essay and poetry at times. The essay invites that stepping back into a second discursive voice uh, that interprets the narrative, guides the reader, and draws on research with a critical eye. I borrow from poets, poetry's ability to draw image and meaning in a few strokes or lines and to sidestep full application, uh, explication in favor of subtle evocation. Um, poet C.D. Wright applies journalistic research methods to the writing of poetry in her uh, award-winning books. Uh, she, has, she has since passed. Poetry for write for uh, this, this woman becomes a renegotiation of the demands of journalism's focus on narrative and its de-emphasis of image and language play. Um, these the journalistic research methods um, excited me a little bit because they are much closer to the academic research process than some of the, uh, some of let's say a visual art creative process might be. Uh, Wright's approach to poetry contains strong echoes of the essay, um, and she draws from oral histories, photographs, newspaper accounts, and interviews with witnesses. So this whole, this whole, um, you know, there's there's a long line of people in different ways who haven't been in academia who um, approach arts through uh, kind of systematic investigation. 
Um, Mary Oliver, I have to bring up um, I, uh, her approach to prose. Uh, she, Oliver, Mary Oliver compared the structure and process of prose writing to a harness and plow. She didn't like prose writing. She wrote, I would rather write poems than prose any day, any place, yet each has its force. Prose flows bravely forward and often serenely, only slowly exposing emotion. Every character, every idea piques our interest until the complexity of it is its asset. We begin to feel a whole culture under and behind it. Poems are less cautious and the voice of the poem remains somehow solitary. And it is a flesh and bone voice that slips and slides and leaps over the bank and out into any river it meets landing with sharp blades on the smallest piece of ice. Well, Oliver's, uh, you know, one of our, one of our best contemporary poets in North America. So if she writes this, it must be true in some place sometimes, but I love the possibilities in the relationship between poetry and prose. Um, I enjoy the nonfiction's attempt to provide a fuller list of facts and context than is required with poetry. This is the academic training um, and, and towards essays, the essay's conversational approach. Um, in these approaches, it's, it's not necessarily going in a straight line. Um, it's an attempt to surround something, a subject, a mood, and a problematic irritation. By coming at it from all angles, wheeling and diving like a hawk, each seemingly digressive spiral actually taking us closer to the heart of the matter. Um, it's a listening, a leaning in, an attention. Uh, Findlay writes that lyric and essay are similar forms of attention in writing about uh, a, a particular artistic practice that combines these forms of attention. Findlay observes that creative mediation with history can help the practitioner avoid speaking for the past and instead speak to it. Uh, again, I think this is a bit of the, the uh, decolonial shift in this is a conversation with um, as opposed to conversation about or um, and my own approach is very much like this. I don't want to speak for my ancestors. I'm looking to speak with them. And there's different form and genres that you can, you can take there. So at the end of this presentation, I return to two questions that have been with me for years. Now, how do you tell what can't be told? And how do you write what can't be written? Um, in Approaching Fire, I wrote letters to my ancestors. Uh, and focused on stories of traditional burning. In Scratching River, the use of redactions in the news stories are one of the tools that I use to answer both these, these questions. So just um, in using news stories about um, court, ongoing court, or a court case that went on uh, challenging the school and the woman uh, who was at the heart of this, uh, uh, who was accused of uh, being responsible for, for the uh, abuse of my brother, um, there had been multiple court cases that had come out, she'd sued people. And I made the decision in, in the document to print the news stories, but to redact her name and the name of the school, partly because it's very openly easily, you can find this information anywhere. So with that background, um, the redactions uh, become um, uh, uh, a little bit like um, uh, moving around the river. So they become the, uh, the river islets. Uh, in, in, this, in this river, um, or the burrs, <laughs> because beside the river a lot grow the, grow the um, plants that, that create burrs. Uh, the redactions are an evocation of what can't be spoken. Lawsuits were used to create fear of speaking out against what was happening, to increase the cost to news organizations of reporting on accusations of abuse, and to inhibit, inhibit the kind of investigative reporting seen in documentary quoted throughout. The redactions represent the difficulty that people, including myself, feel when writing about a person or a topic that has previously been the source of legal proceedings. Practically, in using redactions, I avoid naming the woman at the center of these stories of abuse. But in doing so, I free up the rest of the story to come through with an authenticity, uh, authenticity I would not be able to do if I were naming the person. The redactions also speak to the difficulty of trauma, which can create memory gaps. A part of the story is a conversation between myself and my sister, and we are in part trying to recreate some of the events of coming to know what had happened to our brother and the responses to it. 
The redactions also represent some of the gaps that are part of the child's experience of adult events. In this case, we were not as children given all the information, but pieced together major parts of the story of what happened to our brother through overhearing adult conversations. The redactions are scratchy too, like the burrs that feature in the book on the riverbeds of these uh, braided rivers. At times, they make it hard to understand the sentence or story. Again, this replicates the experience of a child's inability to understand the dark nature of what happened to her brother and the reasons no one could be held accountable. To a child, this is unfathomable. And uh, the redactions also represent the scratchiness, the trauma, uh, and the gaps present in the story of the Métis nation in, in our particular lineage. These stories have been historically hard to access and to understand. In using these redactions, I'm standing with the Métis people who have worked hard to bring attention to our rights, our stories, and our shared history. So how do you tell what can't be told and how do you write what can't be written? I think you tell it a bit scratchy and a bit crooked, the way I felt it, um, the way it felt when you experienced it. You don't have to make it easy, at least I decided not to. Okay, I imagine a whole lot more can come out through questions. That's the, that's the end of this part of my presentation. Great, thank you so much, Michelle, for that wonderful presentation on crooked methodologies um, that had piqued my interest in the lead up to this discussion, thinking what would we be talking about? And uh, <laughs> it was wonderful to hear um, these notions of, of these concepts of home and land identity and how they get braided together through that metaphor. Uh, and the one line that stuck out in my mind was when you were talking, you said, we need stories to understand. Uh, and that's been really quite useful. Maybe at this point in time, um, I'll encourage anyone that may have a question, whether you would like to include it in the chat box, or if you would like to just unmute your microphone, you're most welcome to, to do so uh, on that front. I've been just checking. I don't see anything in the chat box at the moment but wondering around the proverbial table, if there's anyone that may have a question for Michelle in terms of um, the work that she's doing uh, or advice in terms of how to tackle um, some of these crooked methodologies in your own work. So while there's a bit of a lull here, I'm, oh, is there a question there? Yeah, Ryan, uh, yeah, I'm here. Hello. Hello. Hi. Go ahead. Hi, yeah, it's nice to hear the presentation. It's a very excellent topic, and I really enjoyed your presentation about our best method. Um, I was just wondering about, like, you know, when you use the art and poetry, uh, actually, it's, it's, it is like a visualization of people's lives and thinking, right? And our best method actually um, in general we found like it's more uh, effective in uh, facilitation uh, process uh, when there are different views uh, of you know especially in general um, talking about community engagement so do you have any any thought about like especially for first nation and aboriginal communities how, I mean, art actually helps to facilitate discussion and reflect on, on their thought and maybe it's helpful for learning um, and somehow create some kind of dialogue uh, in the process. Well, yeah, yeah, definitely. That um, I, uh, I think the first thing, um, certainly Métis people get together um, is they're telling stories. So, stories in whatever in whatever way they do that actually but that there's always sitting around with <laughs> with the tea um, uh, telling stories so that's the beginning of of um, you know the art of, of oral storytelling but I mean you're right like overall um, uh, in, in your in community-based research um, arts based approaches are a natural fit because arts are the way um, uh, arts-based approaches can bring dialogue. Um, artists are usually the ones, often uh, artists in, are the ones trying to start new conversations about, uh, you know, whatever's most pressing to their, to their nation, to their people, to their geography um, at that time. Um, and yet it's not thre as threatening 
uh, people in community-based research, uh, when you're going around interviewing people, people um, find that much less threatening to begin with as a starting place. It's a natural starting place. And I think what we're calling arts-based research is, is really a natural engagement, a natural way of engaging in, uh, in you know, just um, any sort of discussion or understanding uh, of a topic that to filter it through science, yes, but filter it through um, oral stories, filter it through new stories, filter it through old stories. Um, one of the things I always, I love about, uh, you know, all of these, you know, traditional and new arts is that, um, you know, for example, um, Métis music in, 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 in the Red River Jig, um, uh, the, both the dance and the music, you're playing, the way the uh, the traditional way that's always been played, and then there's this this place in the song for improvisation, place in the dance for what's new, what that what that young person, what that you know uh, other thinker brings into it. Um, so there is place for future innovation, change in all of these traditions. So, but then that's built right into the arts. So that's built right into the understanding. So. Um, to bring that to community-based research um, and to begin or to um, uh, have around the frame of any community-based engagement. Um, um, arts and artists is so important. And I think that in doing that, you, uh, you will uh, get, you know, you will begin to reach into the multiple understandings, some of the uh, contested ideas uh, in, in any place that you're in. Um, uh, but also just reach, uh, have the story, the shared story you're trying to tell with your research through com community-based research, have that reach more people because, um, you know, everybody wants to hear a good story. Everybody wants to, you know, um, engage in the music and the dancing and that, that sort of thing. And that will go farther than <laughs> in many ways than, than just the research paper alone. Thank you very much. Uh, Peter contributed a quote there in the chat box that I'll just point people's attention to if they've not seen it. And Sylvia, did you want to ask your question over live? Yes, thank you, Ryan. And thank you, Michelle, for this comprehensive presentation. I really enjoy it and connect the new presentation to what we have uh, with indigenous populations in Latin America. And for me, mm. it is a learning experience. But my question is more focused on mainstream research and uh, what would be your experiences to secure ethics and rigor in, in mainstreaming research when using arts and crook <laughs> approaches as you name it? Yeah, yeah. Well, um, because um, uh, it's a difficult, tangly process, um, what I've put together for um, these books, um, I actually obtained, um, I obtained um, sort of post haste <laughs> permission because some of it, uh, a good portion of it had been collected sort of not as directly part of these activities. These activities were looking over existing because you're right um, in some places, um, the requirement, the, the variety of, of ethics, you know, hoops you need to jump through. However, um, having moved ahead with, uh, you know, projects, um, the, you know, um, it, it, the treatment, it can depend on the school, depends on the ethics board, depends who's on the board, but increasingly there is a treatment of arts based um, activities as um, um, requiring slightly different protocol than, um, uh, than let's say, you know, um, empirical research, um, particularly if you're not directly interviewing. Uh, so that's also a good portion of the reason I used, I relied so much on, on, on some of those existing texts like the, uh, the ox cart, the, the oral history that has already been in book form by uh, Louis Goulet. And um, 
uh, those types of things. Now, this is a moving target too. I know that Memorial at Memorial University here, they just introduced brand new regulations for indigenous research specifically. So, you know, um, whereas once I was connected to that university and I had a pretty good idea of what you would need to do to go through, you know, ethics, at many universities today, um, it's actually, uh, you know, all, you know, <laughs> you, there's just different, different criteria for um, ethics and it's changing really, really quickly. Um, and keeping on top of that is difficult. So, um, take, uh, enacting, you know, taking the, the artistic process as, you know, um, as, as, uh, as much as you can from, you know, existing historical materials or things that have been collected for other purposes. You can grab stuff from other people that they have done it. There's, there's a variety of ways of, of trying to, you know, negotiate that, that uh, the ethics uh, in different ways. But yeah, um, I guess really the, the shortest answer is it's different for every different, you know, university and project and board so and community that you're working with because i know that um you know um certain first nations groups have you know different ones in different areas will actually have their own requirements for how you can work with them specifically if that's if that's what you're doing and um and i you know the same might go for metis but where we are a mobile and, and a dispersed, you know, a, a group in general, um, it's a little bit looser that uh, those, those, those requirements to let's say get elders, uh, you know, particular elders or this, you know, political group approval. Um, uh, we can go about it in a little bit, uh, a little bit, a little bit freer way uh, with different people. Yeah. Michelle, um, mm -hmm. really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. And Thank you. the surface was scratched. I'm, I'm very curious about it all. Um, you talked about home and you talked about stories and you're a long way from home in one way. Um, so I'm curious as to that displacement and how, how that impacts maybe on your own work because the stories that you tell are of a specific geography of a place, uh, the Red River, um, uh, Manitoba, uh, probably into Saskatchewan. Um, and how does that impact on the art research or that, that, that process? Um, and then those stories that you're drawn to, is there a reason why you're drawn to certain stories rather than other stories? So I know it's yeah, a lot. Yeah. So, um, be, you know, being away from the and uh, why am I drawn to stories? Okay, so first of all, the, the you know, the stories uh, or the, the geography. Uh, living here in Newfoundland Labrador has been, uh, you know, it's, it's been amazing. Uh, we've been here about 12 years now and it's geography is, is, is so different. It's, it is like in, in some ways I could say, you know, another, another, another country being here, having grown up out West. Um, and 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 yet, in 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 some ways, um, it has me turning back west with very very different eyes than when I was out west and didn't know anything else was possible. So there, um, and I, um, it's it's made it dearer to me. The last time um, <laughs> I was planning some, I was planning a bunch more travel this 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 second year of the the postdoc, but. Um, um, you know, the last time I was out on the prairies, I was down to Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and and um, Alberta, and um, the smell of the land called me, and I thought, oh, just the smell, um, the smell of the riverbanks. It's it's this it it's this whole embodied experience. I felt this this incredible longing to stay there, um, and the summers and the you know the smell of the the earth. Um, so yeah, it's, it is, it's made it dear to me and it's made me know it in a different way. Um, and probably made in some ways, the stories more attractive to me because, um, I can, um, tell them in between visits back 
and sort of visit out west and stay with out west, um, stay with that geography in that way. But the that's also been so that's the, the sort of the geographical connection. It's also been the very same thing with the connection to, you know, my, um, my, uh, the, the, my ancestors in that, you know, I, a part of the portion I wrote in a conversation with my great grandfather, who of course I've, I've never met, but um, it became a conversation with my whole place within the Métis nation, you know, as this, you know, as this descendant, you know, a distance from him in many, many ways. And what does this mean? So in a sense, being away physically and through time really uh, can uh, be a, a place for huge creative, um, uh, well, huge creative fodder. It just, you, you're seeing it from a different point of view. And, and again, I, I do go back again to the much of the Métis history of mobility. It was living, uh, you know, home was, uh, you know, there's a route you lived on. And at this point, Newfoundland's just become part of my route, <laughs> my route of home. Um, and how I'm attracted to certain stories, it's, again, the, for me, the arts-based approach, I can sit down and I can write out, you know, um, here are some of the topics that I'm very interested in, but I know uh, once you get into the writing process, once you get into the response process, um, you know, different things happen, new things happen. Uh, I intended to write a lot more closely, I would say, um, about the Métis trails, but they became, you know, a little bit, um, uh, a, they're present, but they're not the strongest part of it. Um, instead, the rivers took over um, because the science, my, my creative response to the science of braiding rivers uh, matched, um, just just matched story and and uh, matched my idea of the, the, the you know the moving um, the, the way I moved around all the time growing up out west and um, and what and what that that felt like and and having you know come from a family where people were from all sorts of places uh, you know different Métis communities from Alberta BC because uh, a lot of the family had moved to BC as well um, and and or originating in Manitoba so these 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 stories really came from um, paying close attention to uh, the land and and the research and my brother came into it because of mobility actually uh, because we spent a good deal of our time of my childhood in a car on the way to visit him wherever he was to um, and that tied in with the historical mating mobility. So here's a contemporary mobility of, you know, traveling to whatever home my brother was in. And then there's the, um, the home that we kept going back to that was always changing because we moved around a lot. So there was this, this whole motion of, of changing homes and, you know, around a Métis culture, identity and power and just this land. So what does it mean to move over this, this, this landscape? And how do you think through that? For me, the only way to think through it is to, uh, begin right in conversation with it and that's that's a process um, and everybody's process will be different so if you sit down to do it you know you want to do this yourself it's not something a, a lot of us academics we like to predict we like to know pretty much what we're going to get when we step into something this is not that at all and um, that can be delightful it can be frustrating at times it can be um, all sorts of things but I think that that's the reality of what you get when you engage with land and landscape um, and, and history and culture in a real way. Um, and in a way from, from the ground up, from the land up, you never know what's going to happen. When is that river gonna flood? You don't, you know, you can say it's gonna, but who knows quite when, <laughs> when is that, you know, when, when is this gonna happen, that gonna happen? Um, you have to let go of those goals, objective and, and, and a little bit, uh, for a little bit you know, and, and, and get, get yourself on that. Again, I'm just using the main team metaphors, get yourself on that trail. And it happens when you're, when you're moving. <laughs> Long answer. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks for that uh, response. I see there's just another quick question or a comment in the, in the um, chat box there. 
Uh, I know we're also running short on time. Um, so I'll see if there's any last questions. Sherry, did you have a short question? I was still on mute, I believe. Can I? Oh, Sherry. Oh, hi there. This, I, sorry, I'm just trying to see the speaker. I just want to say thank, thanks for the presentation. Um, you really, I, I made a couple comments here. I just, uh, you're, you're sharing your journey and your personal story, which must have been a cathartic process, perhaps to some degree. And I just think it's very brave and, and inspiring um, those to explore some new research processes that uh, might be different depending on the discipline you're in. Um, and I was, I was personally, as a geographer and geomorphologist, I was personally fascinated by your metaphor of oh. rivers and fluvial systems. And I'm thinking of a spirit of an agency of water. Yeah. And yeah. I think that came through. And um, I had a question, but I might follow up with you because um, it may be a lengthy one, but I just, um, on that question, but I had a quick question that, oh, it might be quick. I just thought, what's next in your story or in this journey? of your research, where is your research going now is extending beyond and how are you building upon this or are you, or is it taking a different? Um, my grandmother, <laughs> so yeah, so heading toward understanding that whole move to BC. So I'm changing in a sense, in, in, in part of, partly uh, changing geographies to the BC Métis um, uh, context, which is very, very different. and was very different when they moved there in the late 1940s. Um, and understanding um, those movements, um, the, different, the different cultural pressures there, but also the different geography. <laughs> That's very different geography uh, in BC. Um, and so again, balancing um, some contemporary, uh, you know, stories of, of, of of the geography as it is now, and and looking back as to what you know what it was there. So that's that's certainly for sure uh, one thread that I'm going down because approaching fires. The, my, you know, I started with my great grandfather because he was um, he was a really well known fiddler. He was so talented, and he was passing that on to his daughters. And then you know you know um, uh, things changed in, in in that way. So I'm picking up story of women, Métis women, actually, all the women in the family. And, and they're much harder to research because they're women. So <laughs> that mean, I, what I mean is <laughs> that there's much less documentation been kept about women, of course. <laughs> Not that, <laughs> anyway, yeah, there's uh, historically, there's less kept about women. So. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Well, I'm looking forward to reading your book. I ordered it and it's taken a while to write, so it must be in demand. So oh, thank congratulations. You. And now I'm looking forward to reading it in a different light having heard your, uh, your story and your the journey and the conversation you've engaged us in today. So, oh, uh, thank, thank you so you much. I may follow up with you so some other questions. Please do, more, yeah, yeah. More do. implementation for graduate research and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. So, th thanks okay. Perfect. Well, we're just at the top of the hour now. And so I uh, maybe at this point, you, Michelle's contact details are listed there if anybody would like to follow up. I see there's a few, there's one question in the chat box that Adder Hool posted um, that maybe Michelle can, uh, if Ada and Michelle want to stay on for a few more minutes, they might be able to chat about or maybe over email. But at this point, Michelle, thank you so, so much for joining us. This has been truly an interesting journey to, to listen to your journey uh, and to think about it from our own perspectives and what we might be able to do in terms of embedding these crooked methodologies and the arts-based research into the, some of the initiatives that we've got on the go and has provided a lot of food for thought for everyone. So truly thank you for taking the time and, and joining us today. Thank you so much, Ryan, for inviting me in. And thank you everybody for, for coming and asking questions and listening. I've really enjoyed being here. Great. Well, if anyone does have a few extra questions and if Michelle has a few seconds, we can stick around. But otherwise, thank you to everyone. Uh, and the next session will actually take place on November 18th. Uh, when we're joined by Aubrey Street Krug uh, from the Land Institute, and she'll be speaking about biosphere studies. Uh, and there'll be more details coming around about that shortly. So thanks everyone for joining. Uh, and if you have a question that wasn't asked, Michelle might be able to answer it in a few seconds here.